welcome to DinosaurGeorge.com. Uh, I'm answering questions I receive from you through my website. Uh, if you've got a question you'd like to ask, uh, feel free to visit the site and uh, click on the Ask Dinosaur George page, fill out the form, and I will certainly try to answer your questions. Okay, let's get right into it. Uh, Eric from Denhelder, Holland wrote to me and said, is it possible that Archaeopteryx could be the descendant of the Hoatzin, which is a modern bird, because the Hoatzin has tiny claws to help them climb up when they were little, and when they grow older, the claws will ultimately despair, which, which basically means they'll, they'll go away. Um, that's a great question, man. Check this out. This is an Archaeopteryx. And when we look at Archaeopteryx, here, let me bring them up here. When you look at an Archaeopteryx, one of the things that you notice is that it's got claws on its hands and feet. They're perfectly suited for being able to help this animal crawl up into trees. Some paleontologists believe that Archaeopteryx was not really a flyer. In other words, he didn't, he didn't just flap his wings and take off flying. Some believe that what he did was he actually crawled up into trees and launched himself and acted as a glider. Uh, well, certainly the um, Hoatzin, which is a bird that uh, they find down in South America, that bird uses its claws to, to climb trees as well. So yeah, that's a great analogy that those two animals are related. I think you're right. I agree with you that uh, it certainly would be a perfect example of how some modern birds retain some of the dinosaur qualities from their ancestors. I'll tell you another animal to look up. Look up the Sariema. This is a bird. Its, its name is spelled S-E-R-I-E-M-A. -E -E I think it's Sariema. Um, this is a bird. When you look at its foot, you won't believe it. In fact, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com, click on the blog page, and go back through my archives. Back in 2008, I wrote an article about this bird, and there's some great footage there that will show you its foot. This thing is a living, breathing raptor. It is beyond belief when you see the curved killing claw on its foot. You, you won't believe it. Um, so certainly, yes, I agree with you completely that Archaeopteryx was a descendant, or Ho the Hoatzin is a descendant of the Archaeopteryx, and they have a lot of similar features. Very good. He also wants to know if I thought raptors uh, lived in groups. Um, and if so, what, uh, what would demonstrate that they lived in packs? Well, we look at the hawks here in Texas. I believe that's our red-tailed hawks. They hunt in groups. They are flying predatory birds that hunt in groups. Um, so right off the bat, we know that at least we have evidence that some birds hunted in, in groups. And uh, they do today, so there's no reason to believe that their ancestors um, or their predecessors, the raptors, didn't do the same thing. So I believe raptors would have been more successful by hunting in a group. And we find a lot of evidence of, uh, of multiple raptors attacking an individual animal. So it's pretty clear to me that I absolutely believe that raptors were more successful hunting in packs. Uh, and then he also wants to know if Utah Raptor did the same thing. Well, yeah, I think they did, and, and again, here's why. Even though Utah Raptor is a pretty big dinosaur, um, he still would have been more successful hunting at least with one other mate, or at least in a group. Hunting in a group allows you the ability to, to use a multitude of styles in order to catch your prey. When you're by yourself, you're pretty much relegated to hiding and jumping out or hoping you chase somebody down, but you can't employ other kind of tactics. So I believe Utah Raptor, in order to be successful, would have had to have lived and hunted in packs in order to have the best chance of survival. Uh, Joseph from Columbus, Ohio, speaking of Utah Raptor, he wants to know, how big do I think Utah Raptor was? Well, Joseph, Utah Raptor's a big dude. I mean, let me, let me show you something. This is the foot of a, uh, of a, um, uh, a uh, Velociraptor. Now, I want you to pay close attention to this little claw right here. This claw is the killing claw. This is how big the claw is of Velociraptor. Now, first, let me tell you this. Velociraptor was not as big as they showed in Jurassic Park. They're just not that big. Velociraptor only stood about three feet tall, and his whole body length was right at five and a half, maybe six feet long. So he's not as big as Jurassic Park, but I just want to show you this. This is the killing claw of a Velociraptor. Now, I want you to look at the killing claw of a Utah Raptor in comparison to it. Take a look at the difference in size between these two dinosaurs. Look at the size difference between these guys. Try to imagine an animal 
who had this enormously giant claw. You can only imagine just how big this thing was. Uh, now this is a model, this is a recreation of a Utah Raptor claw, and uh, it may be a little bit bigger than it was in real life, but um, here's what I think its size was. I believe Utah Raptor was probably about 20 feet in length at the most. I think he may have weighed close to 1,500 pounds. He was, uh, probably stood right at maybe five, maybe going as tall as six feet uh, in a standard posture. He could certainly raise up to be considerably taller than that. Uh, the problem with Utah Raptor is he's kind of a rare dinosaur and that always makes it tough to know true sizes because we don't have complete evidence to, to give us the uh, the uh, idea. Uh, I do have a Utah Raptor skull. I wish I had it here with me. I'd show it to you in comparison to a Deinonychus skull. Utah Raptor is just a big nasty dude. So uh, thanks for your question, Joseph. Uh, finally, my friend Raptor, uh, uh, Connor, but I call him Raptor, uh, from Lexington, Kentucky. He writes, despite the fact that the only complete remains of Spinosaurus aegypticus were destroyed near the end of World War II when the Allies bombed Berlin in 1945, would you say it's possible to think that this large theropod may have been a beachcomber and fish like its relatives, Baryonyx? Jurassic Park 3 portrays it as a streamlined predator being able to kill large game. And he writes, the scene where it kills the T-Rex is an example, though I know that it could not it, it could not, despite it being larger. Uh, great comment, Raptor. Let me tell you, first of all, you and I and a whole lot of people got insulted when that Spinosaurus killed Tyrannosaurus Rex. You know, in, in paleontology, we're not supposed to take things personally, but I drew a line in the sand and I said, you're not going to have a Spinosaurus kill a Tyrannosaurus Rex. It's just not going to happen. Unfortunately, they didn't ask for my opinion in consulting, so what do I know? Um, I agree with you. I believe this animal made its living catching fish. Um, here's a claw from a Spinosaurus. Now, Spinosaurus's claw is uh, not really the kind of claw that we see in other predators. When you look at it, it's very, very thick across the center. Uh, see how thick that is? Most predatory claws are um, not as broad, whereas uh, in my opinion, this claw is really designed to go into something like a slippery fish, make a huge hole, jab it, hang on to it, and bring it back up to its mouth. So right off the bat, you look at the claws, and, and that kind of suggests that uh, it was using them to catch fish and not inflict big, deep gashes into huge prey. Second of all, you look at the skull design. It's got a long crocodilian snout. That's really better suited for catching fish. It's almost shaped like the jaws of a gharial. Um, its, its elongated snout meant that it didn't have as powerful a bite force. Its snout was not nearly robust enough. I think it would have literally broken its nose had it tried to, uh, had it tried to uh, attack bigger prey. And finally, it's the question of that sail, that enormous sail down its back. What on earth was it doing with that sail? I believe because it spent a lot of time in the water, it had problems losing body heat. And I believe that sail truly was a gigantic solar panel that kept his batteries recharged and kept him warm. He lived in a very hot, humid environment, but that doesn't matter. Being in the water, uh, hypothermia can set in. It doesn't, that water doesn't have to be freezing in order to, to zap the heat from your body. So I believe that you take the hand claw design, you take the jaw design, you take that sail and you put them all together and in my opinion that tells me that that dinosaur is using uh, its body to catch fish and that's what I think he's best suited for. Whether he hunted in the oceans, whether he hunted in rivers and lakes, I don't know, but I think he did a little of everything. All right, uh, that's it. Go to the website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Like I said, when you go there, click on the blog. Uh, I've got a cool blog page. Um, I, I always put new information. I just posted information recently about a new discovery, which is really cool. So check out the blog, check out all the other pages. Make sure to sign up for our free monthly newsletter. Thank you guys so much for visiting. If you have a question, click on Ask Dinosaur George and I'll certainly do my best to answer it. Until next time, take care, take care of yourself, and take care of the others around you because we're all in this game together. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon.